Good morning. It's great to be here. It's so great to see everyone out. Couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here at the Lafayette Church of Christ. And we are so, so, so very thankful that you have chosen to come out and be with us this morning. I want you to listen. If I stood here long enough, you'd hear a baby cry. <laughs> Isn't that a sweet sound? <laughs> I love it. it. It says that the church is growing. I love to hear those babies cry. You know, when you think about a baby, and we, we have been blessed with some precious babies in this congregation recently, I, I think about those babies. If there's an expectation that we have of them, is we have the expectation for them to grow. You know, just, just like you see these young men and these young women and lads to leaders, and they are doing such a spectacular job. And what they do, we, we look forward to those young ones growing up and following in their footsteps, don't we? We like to see them grow. Parents want to see them grow. And the parents take the babies to the doctors. The doctors expect to see them grow. Growth is something that you expect when you look upon a child. Likewise, when it comes to a Christian. How does the Bible describe us when we become Christians? Peter would describe us as newborn babes in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2. Wouldn't he? He would say as newborn babes in Christ desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. As God looks upon us as his children, as babies, when we are born into the family of God, when we become Christians, he looks upon us and he expects us to grow. He wants us to grow. And he's made everything necessary so that you and I can grow. Just like mothers and fathers, they do everything they can to make sure that those children grow physically. God has done everything within his power, and then some, to make it possible that we grow spiritually. That's why Peter would command in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 18, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The greatest thing that you and I can ever grow into in this life, and this, there we go, is becoming more like Christ. There's, there's nothing greater that you and I can do in this life. As a Christian, I want to grow. But, but when it's all said and done, every day that I do grow, I want to make sure that I am becoming more like Christ in the life that I live. Our theme this year is we believe. We've been talking about how that we believe in God. We believe in creation. We've been talking about how we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe Him to be the Son of the living God. We believe Him to be deity. We believe Him to be God in the flesh. He came and was God in the flesh, and He suffered and died for mankind. We believe that. It's not enough that we just want to believe in Jesus. Are you with me? I want to be like Him. I want to be like Jesus. And I need to believe that I can be like Jesus Christ. That's what God wants. God wants me to be like Him. In the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 29, the Bible says, For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. You and I, when we became Christians, it was God's purpose that we conform our lives, that we take our lives and we mold it so that we can become more like Jesus Every day that we live. You know, the older I get, when people look at my mom and they look at me and they look at a picture of my mom, they will say, you know, the, more, the older you get, the more you look like your mom. And that, that's true. Because I was made after her image. But I resemble her physically. And I'm going to continue to resemble her physically because of the DNA structure within me. But if I'm going to become more like the image of Christ, that's because of something that I'm going to have to do. And we can do that. We can do what is necessary so that you and I can become more like Christ every day that we live. So that when people look at you and me, you remember when Paul wrote to the Philippians and he says, let, it, let your life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ in Philippians chapter two and verse, or Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20. And what Paul is saying in that passage of Scripture, when people see you, they need to be able to see the Jesus Christ living in you. And we can do that. We believe, right? We believe that He was God. We need to believe that we can be like Him. And that should be the goal. Yeah. 
the aspiration of every Christian. But how is that possible? I want to suggest three things that are necessary in order for you and I to become more like Christ in the life that we live. Number one, we've got to be crucified with Him. Number two, we've got to have the attitude of Christ. And number three, we have to live like Him. Let's begin, first of all, with the fact if I'm going to be more like Christ every day that I live, I must be crucified with Christ. Now, you know the passage in the Bible, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, where Paul would write and say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'd be willing to say if we went around the room this morning that most everyone knows that passage. That's one of those passages I learned when I started the Memphis School of Preaching. It's one just stuck right there. It's like glue. It's like a part of me. And I, I don't know if I'll ever forget that passage. But it's not enough for us to know the passage and have the passage memorized. What did Paul mean when he said, I am crucified with Christ? Let's begin with the word crucified. What does that mean? If you crucify someone, that means that you have put them to death. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. But what did Paul mean by that? He had not put himself to death completely, or else he couldn't write this passage of Scripture. What was it that Paul had put to death in his life? When you think about Jesus Christ, what is it about him that amazes you the most? What is it about him that just stands out above all things? Some might say, well, David, he could... He could heal any form of sickness. And that, that's true. I mean, that, that was just fascinating. Brother Don and I stopped and visited with, with a, an elderly man and his daughter yesterday. And Brother Don brought out the fact, if Paul was there, he could just put his hands on that child and healed her like that. And Jesus could have done that. Jesus didn't even have to be there. He could just say, go thy way, your daughter is healed. And I mean, Jesus had that power. That's fascinating, but that, that's not what fascinates me the most. Raise the dead. I mean, is that not fascinating to, to be able to, to, for him to just walk up and say, rise up, and, and, and for Lazarus to come forth? From, oh, that's fascinating, but that doesn't fascinate me the most. You know what stands out to me about Jesus more than anything? I think you're probably thinking what I'm thinking. He never committed a sin. Never committed a sin. Lived in a fleshly body for approximately 38 years, the same kind of body that you and I have. Experienced the same temptations or like temptations, just like what you and I experienced. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. And he never committed a sin. Not once. He would even say to the people in John 8 and verse 46, which of you can convict me of sin? Can you imagine that? Putting your life on display and say, find some sin. I wouldn't do that, would you? Because you could find some sin in my life. But Jesus could do it because he never committed a sin. The Hebrew writer would say of him in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15, he was tempted like as we are yet without sin. He never committed one. Peter would say of him in the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22 that he did no sin. We could go on and on and on. Jesus never committed a sin. And that's what fascinates me the most about Jesus. And at the same time, you know what keeps us from being like Jesus more than anything? What is it? It's sin. What keeps me from being like Him? It is sin. And so what do I have to do? If I'm going to be like Him, I've got to crucify that man of sin. And that's what Paul is talking about in this passage of Scripture. We crucify that man of sin. What does it mean to crucify that man of sin? We put him to death. That means the person who we were at one time, we are no longer that person. We don't live like that person. We don't make those choices anymore. We don't live our lives in those sins anymore. The Roman writer would speak of this in Romans chapter 6. Evidently, those brothers and sisters didn't understand. And so they thought, what, shall we continue in sin that may, grace may abound? And Paul said, no in no way. God forbid. And then what Paul would do in that passage of Scripture is he would tell what they had done in order to be crucified with Christ, to put that man to sin, that man of sin to death, and then what they needed to do, continue on. He said, know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ rose from the dead, we also should rise to walk in newness of life. What's Paul saying? Do you realize that in the act of baptism, what you do is you put that old man to death. You put that man to death and you rise to walk in newness of life. You don't live that way anymore. You see, at the point of baptism, every sin that you have ever committed, it's gone. Acts 2 and verse 38. Is that not what Peter told the people on the day of Pentecost? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You know what what Peter is saying in that passage? Be crucified with Christ. Put that old man of sin to death. It happens in the waters of baptism. And then as Paul would say in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, we rise up to do what? Walk in newness of life. You don't live in those sins anymore. You don't live in obedience to those sins anymore. You don't live practicing those sins anymore. You live in a new life. A new life for Christ Jesus. Living for Him. Walking for Him. Walking with Him. That's why John would say if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. And you see, it's the blood of Jesus Christ that remits, it takes away our sins. But when we walk in the light, to walk in the light is to follow Jesus. <laughs> if we're going to be like Jesus, who do we need to follow? We need to follow Jesus. And when we do that, brothers and sisters, we are crucified to Christ, but we have to live a life, like Paul said, crucified to Christ. Every day, I'm going to be presented with the option to do that which is good or that which is bad. When I'm crucified with Christ, you know what I'm going to do? I'm always going to choose that which is good. It's not going to be a question. I'm not going to say, well, do do I need to do this? Or can I do this? I'm only going to do what God wants me to do. Because I've been crucified with Him. And by living a crucified life, as Paul is talking about in this passage, then I will be like Jesus. But not only do we need to be people who we are crucified with Christ, it's also important that we are people who have the attitude of Christ. I want you to think about a passage of Scripture with me. It's found in the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. And I appreciate Brother Wayne reading this passage of Scripture. And this is a passage that you know you've probably read many times. You may even have it memorized. But what does it mean? Paul said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. I want you to look at the word mind. Now that word mind there has a number of different meanings. It can mean to think. It can mean to form an opinion. It can mean to develop an attitude. I think what Paul is saying here in this passage of Scripture is that if you are going to be like Christ, you know what you've got to have? You've got to have His attitude. We understand what attitude is, don't we? Sure. How many times, parents, do we say of our children, you need an attitude adjustment. Most of the time, my daddy adjusted my attitude with a piece of leather. And sometimes it takes different measures. But nevertheless, we understand what the word attitude means. Paul is saying in this passage, if you're going to be like Jesus Christ, you've got to have the attitude of Christ. And then I love what Paul does. He doesn't stop right there by just saying, you know, you need to have the attitude that Jesus had. He tells us what Jesus' attitude was. What was his attitude? Number one, his attitude was sacrifice. How do we know that? Look at what he says. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now look at this next phrase. Who being in the form of God. What does that mean? That means he was like God. And if you have trouble understanding that, look at what he said. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. When the Bible says he was in the form of God, that lets us know that he was equal to God. Jesus is not below the Father as some denominational groups teach today. The Bible is very plain that he was equal with the Father. He was just as much God, just as much deity as was the Father. And so he was equal with God. And then I want you to know what the Bible says. It says he made himself of no reputation. Some translations say he emptied himself. And I think that's a good rendering because that's basically what it means. 
But the question, when you look at this verse, everybody wants to know, what was it that Jesus emptied himself of? And so people are going to begin to reason, what is it that he gave up? What was it that he emptied himself up? And, and someone will say, well, maybe he emptied himself of deity. I don't believe that for a second. When Jesus was here on earth, as we saw a few weeks ago, He was still God even though He was in the flesh. Being in the flesh did not limit Him from any of His deity abilities. It didn't take away His name. He still bore the name of God. He was the Son of God. How many times has He referred to His Lord and Master throughout the Bible? Even Thomas recognized Him, my Lord and my God. And the reason Thomas would do that is because that's exactly who He was. So he didn't give up his name of deity. What about his power? Was there anything that he could not do? Oh, there were times when the disciples couldn't heal a sickness, but there was not a sickness Jesus couldn't heal. Even bringing people from the dead, Jesus could do it. And so Jesus did not give up being God. He didn't empty himself of being God. How did he empty himself? Let's read on and Paul tells us. He made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant. Now you remember what form he was in? He was in the form of God. He was a king. And he became a slave. Now folks, that's sacrifice. To take a king's position and to become a slave. Sacrifice. But not only did Jesus have the attitude of sacrifice, but when you continue to read and study this passage of Scripture, we also see that He had the attitude of humility. How do we know that? Just keep reading. The Bible says, And being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Now, if that is not an example of humility, I, I don't know what is. The Bible plainly says he humbled himself. Is that not amazing? The creator and sustainer of this world humbled himself. The creator and sustainer of this world had to learn to be obedient just like you and I so that salvation could be possible for us. Man, you're talking about humility. Submitting to the will of another? That's Jesus Christ. And it's not just any death that he submitted to. Paul brings out the fact that he submitted to the point of the death of the cross. There was not a more heinous death known to man at that time. Even in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, death of the cross is referred to as a curse. And that goes all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy. To an individual who would, to a Jew, if you were hung on a cross, that person was cursed because they were guilty of crimes and they were worthy of death. And Jesus hung on the cross. To the Romans, the word cross was such an obscenity that they did not even want the word made mention. And yet that's the, G, the death that Jesus allowed. Now you tell me why. Because he was submissive to the Father's will. You remember in the garden? Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, your will be done. What is that? Folks, that's humility. And so when you look at the attitude of Jesus, his attitude was sacrifice. His attitude was humility. What is our goal? I want to be like Jesus. If I'm going to be like Jesus, I've got to be crucified with Him. And every day I've got to live that crucified life. But it, has, it can't stop there. I need to have the attitude of Jesus. You see, it's the attitude of Jesus that causes me to live that crucified life. I live every day sacrificing my life. I live every day with the attitude of humility, just like Jesus. Is that what Paul encouraged in the book of... Uh, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. I beseech you. And the word beseech is just a word which literally means to beg. I'm begging you. What's Paul begging for? Brethren, that you, uh, by the mercy of God, excuse me, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. What is Paul begging for? He's begging for them to be a sacrifice. He's begging for them to have humility because... To be a sacrifice, you know what it requires? It requires humility, just like Jesus Christ. Why would He sacrifice His life? Because He's the greatest example of humility to you and me. 
There was no greater example. And if I'm going to be like him, you know what I have to be? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. I have to be sacrificed in the life that I live. I have to be willing to give up my wishes and my wants and my wanted recognition and recognize I'm going to live a life for Christ Jesus. If Jesus could give up kingship and take upon servantship, can I do the same? I can. And I must. And I'm going to be like him. Someone says, David, how in the world can you do that? I mean, that's, that's just impossible, is it? No, it's not. Read on in verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you know how that you and I practice sacrifice and humility? Every day we make up our mind, that's what I'm going to do. When I woke up this morning, you know what my mind was made up? I'm going to be a sacrifice for God. I'm going to be humble for God. And that's what I'm going to strive to do. And tomorrow morning, if the Lord permits me to wake up, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be a sacrifice. I'm going to be humble before God. And when I strive to be a sacrifice and I strive to be humble, it leads me to live that life crucified to Christ. But if I don't have that attitude, I'll just be a name on the roster. Is that what you want to be? Do you want to just be a name on the roster at Fayette Church of Christ? Or do you want God to look down and say, crucified with Christ. Man, that's my sir. That's what I want to be. Isn't that what you want to be? We want to be those people that we are living like Jesus. And it requires us to have the attitude of Jesus. And then finally, if we're going to be like Jesus, we have to be crucified with Him. We have to have His attitude. But finally, we have to live like Him. Now listen, if we don't have the first two things, if we are not crucified with Him... It's not going to do us any good to live like Him because if you've not been crucified with Him, you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. And if you have been crucified with Him, you've been baptized into Christ, but you're not living like He wants you to, you don't have His attitude, these things are not going to do you any good that we're going to talk about. So I've got to conclude right now. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm living that crucified life. And I'm going to have the attitude of Christ. And when I have the attitude of Christ, I'm going to live like what does it take to live like Christ? I think Peter says it better than any Bible writer. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, Peter would say, He left us an example. You know how the verse goes? That we should what? Following His steps. Following His steps. You ever followed in someone's steps before? When I was a little boy, I can remember my daddy as he would go through the woods and and he would walk, and he didn't know I was watching him, but wherever he stepped, I was stepping. Now, he had long legs. This man was 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and, and so it was hard for me to stretch my legs out, but I literally would stretch my legs out to follow in his steps. And I think that's what Peter is saying. You need to look at the life that Jesus lived, and you need to step like he stepped. When you crucify with Christ, and you have his attitude, you can do that. I know, folks, there are many things that Christ did in the life he lived. Now, I know our time is running out. But I want to make mention of just a few things that we remember about Jesus. If we're going to be like him, we've got to do these things. Think about how righteous he was. I love the fact that John speaks of him in the book of 1 John chapter 2, in, in verse 1. He said, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, note if you will, John does not say that he was righteous, though we know he was. John says he was the righteous. And the word righteous there literally means an individual who's in a right relationship with God. Brothers and sisters, go back to what we have talked about. Jesus chose to live that way. He chose to be righteous. He was already righteous. He was the Son of God. He was deity. He was the epitome of perfection. And I think that's what John is trying to teach us in this passage of Scripture. Jesus Christ was not just righteous. He was the righteous, the most righteous being that you and I could ever imagine. And the Bible teaches us that we are to be like Him. That's impossible, David. There's no way that we can be righteous like Jesus Christ. 
Well, we need to read the Bible then because in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 7, the Bible teaches us that if we practice righteousness, oh, you need to look at it. You are righteous just as Jesus is righteous. Now, folks, I didn't write that. John did through inspiration. And John says when I practice righteousness, and practicing righteousness is following the message in this book, I can be righteous just like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus, don't you? You know what I need to do? I need to be righteous. How do I be righteous? I follow the teachings found in God's Word. And in doing that, I'll become more like Jesus. I need to be compassionate. Compassion is often a term that is thought of as looking upon someone and and you see their pain, and you just kind of feel sorry for them. You ever been there before? Man, every time I take a mission trip, I, I see kids, and I see adults, and I, I see their pain, and I feel so sorry for them. Folks, that's not compassion. When you read and study the Bible, and you look at the word compassion, compassion is an action word. Every time you see it, you see someone in action, for example, with Jesus. The Bible describes him as being a man of compassion. And you know what it did? It moved him to do what he did in life. When he, when he healed all of the people who came to him who were sick, you know why he did it? Because of compassion. When he fed those thousands of people that come to him, you know why he did it? Because of compassion. You remember in Luke the 7th chapter when he comes to the widow of Nain there and her son is being taken to be buried and she walk, he walks up and puts his hands on the coffin and raised? Why does he do it? The Bible says because of compassion. Compassion moved him to make life better for people. And if I'm going to be like Jesus, you know what I need? I need to be compassionate. In fact, that's what the Bible teaches in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8. Above all things, we're to have compassion for one another. We've got to. In fact, in 1 John 3 and verse 17, there's no way that you can be an individual as a child of God and express love in your life if you don't have compassion. It is a necessity. Too often we are like the priest and the Levite. Oh, we are religious people. But we see people hurting. And we walk right by on the other side. You know who we need to be like, don't you? We need to be like the Samaritan there in Luke chapter 10. We need to be compassionate. When you see that man, he went to him, he helped him, put him on his own beast, took him to an inn, took care of him there, gave the money at the gave the man at the inn money and told him, You keep on taking care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you. That's compassion. And if we're going to be like Jesus, that's what we have to be. We have to be people of compassion. We need to be people of forgiving. Oh, wasn't Jesus forgiving in the life that he lived? So forgiving. I mean, he forgave the woman who was taken in adultery in the very act. And Jesus forgave her. Think about the thief on the cross who turned and said, you know, forgive me. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Think about the many times that he forgives you and me in life. John would say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. How often? Every time we turn to him. Why do you suppose Jesus is so forgiving to teach us? Remember what Peter said? He left us an example to follow in his steps. To teach us the importance of forgiveness. We need to be people who are forgiving. I'm sad to say I've heard Christians say before, I'll never forgive him. Never. And sadly in Mark, Matthew chapter 6 verses 14 and 15, if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. I must be willing to forgive over and over and over again. There's no, my forgiveness should have no limitation. You know, Peter thought that it did. You remember in Matthew chapter 18, he comes to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Now, Peter's trying to be religious here. So seven times. You know, seven's a perfect number. But if you exceed that perfect number, cut off. You remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, I say not until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now, 70 times seven is 400. I don't think that Jesus is saying, Peter, you need to go home, get you a good thick notebook, and keep track 490 times. And on 491, you don't have to forgive him anymore. Who in their right mind would do that? I take that back. You might know someone who would do that, but why would you do that? 
If you want a more clear passage, go to Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, where Jesus would say, Take heed unto thyself. If thy brother sins against thee, you rebuke him. And if he repents, you forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day, and seven times in a day turn again and says, I repent, you shall forgive him. Again, is Jesus putting a limitation? No. We just don't keep track of stuff like that because God doesn't treat us that way. And if I want to be like Jesus, you know what I have to do? I have to forgive over and over and over again just like he forgave over and over again. If I'm going to be like Jesus, I need to be loving like him. The Bible describes God in one word in 1 John 4 and verse 8 and verse 16. God is, what's the word? Love. And Jesus personified the Father while here on earth, didn't he? In John chapter 14, Philip said, show us the Father. You remember how Jesus responded? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus is basically saying that whatever attribute you can give to God, you can give that same attribute to me. If God is love, then what is Jesus? He is love. And the greatest example of love that has ever been shown unto man was by Jesus Christ, was it not? Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Tell me what Jesus did for you and me. He laid down his life. And when he laid down his life and he went to the cross so that incidentally you and I could live that crucified, Christ, crucified life and have the attitude of Christ, brothers and sisters, he expressed to us the greatest love that's ever been known. And what's the greatest commandment given to you and me? You remember the lawyer who came to Jesus in Matthew 22? Oh, what's the greatest commandment? He thought he was going to catch Jesus. But you can't catch the lawmaker and the lawgiver. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the greatest command. Have love in your life. And nothing has ever changed. What was the greatest characteristic that Jesus said His disciples needed to have in their lives? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. John 13, 34, and 35. And now abides faith. Oh, the power and faith. And now abides hope. Oh, the anchor of our soul. But the greatest of these is what? It's love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. There is no greater characteristic in our life because love characterized the life that Jesus lived. And if I'm going to be like Him, I'm going to become like Him, I have to be loving. And then finally, what about the fact that Jesus was so prayerful? It's amazing to, to do a study of the word prayer and then look at the life of Jesus. And, and, and not only do you see him praying so many times. When, when he fed the 5,000, when he fed the multitudes, he prayed. You see him in the Garden of Gethsemane, and what is he doing? He's praying. I mean, it, it, he's just always praying over and over and over again. I suppose one of my favorite times wherein he prayed is, is in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12 where the Bible says he stayed up all night long praying. I've often wondered what in the world would Jesus say all night long? And then I get up and I look in the mirror and I look at me and I know how much he needs to pray for me. <laughs> and you think about every person in the world. and He knows the hearts of all people, does he not? Did he not know the hearts of all people then? Oh, he had a lot to pray for. That, that's an amazing example for me. And, and not only was he one who prayed, he taught prayer. He encouraged his disciples to pray. Luke 18 and verse 1, men ought to always pray and not to faint. Don't ever give up on prayer. Don't ever get to the point where you say, well, this is just not working. It is working. You and I can have confidence when it comes to prayer. In the book of Psalm chapter 34, the Bible says, the righteous cry and the Lord hears and answers and delivers them from their troubles. Romans 12 and verse 12, continue instantly in prayer. You can have confidence in prayer. And if Jesus needed to pray, where does that put David Payton? Where does that put you? Now, folks, we could, we could talk about a lot more things that becoming like Jesus, but the, the point is, is I want to be like Jesus. Don't you? Several years ago, I went to visit my father one day, and he was out in the yard, and he was plowing, and, and he got off the tractor, and he said, get on. I said, what is it, Daddy? He said, I want you to plow. I've never been on a tractor before. I've never plowed before. And I said, Daddy, I said, this is going to be a snake row. He said, no, it's not. 
He said, I, what I'm going to do... Now, when you look at a row like that, I love to ride by a field and see a beautiful road. The, the way that they're so straight today is through laser most of the time. Folks, my daddy could plow a row from here to the other end of Lafayette and, it would, and then turn around and plow one right beside it. And, and I mean, they would be perfect. He just did it by eye. And, and, and so I said... Daddy, how am I going to do that? And he said, stay right here. He went to the far end of the field, and he took a stake, and he drove it into the ground. He came back, and he said, now, he said, I want you to put the tractor in gear. And he said, you look at that stake. And he said, don't take your eyes off of it. And I did. I went straight to that stake. And that was the prettiest row, the straightest row I had ever plowed in my life. And that's a lesson he taught me that I will never forget. And as I look back on that story, it, it reminded me of a, a passage of Scripture in the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, the Hebrew writer would write and say, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand throne of God. Look at what Paul said. If you want to be like Jesus, you know what we need to do? We need to look to him. And that word look means to gaze upon. You know what it means to gaze upon something. This is not just a quick pass by look. But you are looking intently to learn. If you and I are going to be more like Jesus, we have to look to him. And when we do that, then we'll live every day becoming more like Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a child of God. You need to become like Jesus. You need to be obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in, the, in, in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And let us baptize you for the remission of sins. And you leave here this morning with the attitude, I'm going to be like Jesus. And, and, and when we have this attitude, brothers and sisters, we, we will be like Jesus in the life that we live. Maybe you're here this morning and... And you're already a child of God and your life is not right. Maybe you haven't been living like Jesus and you know you need to change. Then now is the time to do that. Whatever your need may be, won't you come as we stand and as we sing.